Okay, today I'm going to be talking to Toby Boyle. Toby, how are you? Hey, Vic. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm. 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 I'm really well, actually. Um, yeah, it's been good. It's good. good to speak to you because it's been a few years actually since we've had a chat. You know. So, yeah. um, so my first yeah, question, know. Toby. Traditional first question is: What do you do? What do I do? Well, I'm a musician. Um, have been a musician all my, pretty much all all my working life. Apart from, uh, I think I had a proper job for about three or four months in an office, and then got the hell out as quickly as I could and became self-employed. Um, and then I became a professional musician, as in I was doing that. That was my my job, my income from about the age of twenty twenty one. I think it was twenty one, twenty two. So, um, uh, and I'm 53 now, so it's been sort of 30 years or so of, of making music and doing all the things us musicians do to, to uh, try and make a living, you know, one way or another. Yeah, um, so, and, and, for, and also for the last sort of 20 years or so, I've been helping people as well in a sort of coaching and therapeutic uh, manner, I suppose you'd say. Um, and um, working a lot with musicians and performers, um, particularly over the last few years, but um, but also you know every day. I, I almost said normal people then, I mean, people other than musicians, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> non musicians as well, all, yeah. all kinds of people. Um, so I've I've been doing that kind of alongside and 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 the stuff that I work with mostly is, is NLP, which I know you, yeah. you as well, you've trained in. Um, and, um, and, and I use that a lot in music, you know, I use that in performing a lot myself and also in teaching. So I've been teaching guitar like you, I've been teaching since I was about 18. Um, well, I barely learned to play anything myself and I was already teaching people, you know, um, so, and, and that's really how I got into all the NLP stuff was, was, was uh, I, I read a book um, by a guy called Joseph O'Connor, um, a book called Not, Not Pulling the Strings, and that was all about how to use NLP in yeah. teaching. So that, that kind of got me interested in, I'd, I'd, I've always been interested in how the mind works and how people learn and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but that book in particular got me into the whole subject, and then I went and did training in it, you know. Um, so, um, so yeah, I was, I, that, that's pretty much the big picture of what I do, job wise. Cool. We're going yeah. to cover, we're going to cover a lot of that, I think, in this conversation because, as, as you say, it's something that really fascinates me as well. Cool. Um, so, how did it start? How did you get started? To, you know, there's this thing. There's a guitar. Oh my god, <laughs> what's this? No, how did it? St- <laughs> how did it start? I actually started off, um, I wasn't a guitar player to start off with. I, I started off learning um, clarinet and then saxophone and uh, piano at school um, and from quite an early age. And um, so, and I actually started gigging on the sax before I even played the guitar. Oh, right. I think I was Eagles when I was about 15 or something like that. And um, and then I, um, you know, I, I really got into rock music when I was 14, 15, 16, heavy rock in particular. Um, so, of course, you know, and, and also I was getting quite interested in girls as well at that point. So. Yeah, it sort of, sort of goes together, doesn't it, somewhere? Yeah, the, the, the sort of Zen diagram of, uh, you know, rock music, um, possibility of girls, you know, being interested there was a meeting in the middle there and uh 
but no, I, I just really, really, I just fell in love with guitar and I was listening to um, people like my heroes at the time were, were people like Michael Schenker and, um, and the guys from Iron Maiden and, and all, all that really heavy stuff, Angus Young. So um, like, like a lot of us guitarists, I suppose. And um, so I started learning guitar when I was about 16, I think. So it was quite late compared to some of my, some of my schoolmates. Um, but I was really determined and I, I, um, I, I just wanted to be, get really good really quickly. So I, um, I, I just really kind of went for it, you know, and, and dedicated myself to, to learning it. Um, and it wasn't easy to start off with because I didn't have a teacher. I was, I was learning stuff with, uh, you know, with the old fashioned way with, with tape, tape recorders and, yeah. Also putting the needle back on the record and yeah, yeah. Um, so so I developed a good ear doing that. Um and uh yeah, just practiced like mad for the first few years. I was some sometimes I was, you know, all, all my mates went off to uni. Um I had a place at uni, but I didn't go, so by that point I decided I wanted to be a musician. Much much to the horror of my um school teachers at the time that thought I was absolutely throwing my life away and oh, you'll never make a living. There's too many people trying to do it and all those kind of, uh, yeah. you know, beliefs being thrown at me. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I stuck with it and, and practiced like mad. I, I was doing sort of four or five hours practice um, for the first few years every day, more or less every day. So I got, I got pretty good pretty quick, you know, and, and I think I was gigging within less than a year of picking up guitar. So I think it helps learning the other instruments first. Yeah. I kind of knew what music was and what scales were. So it's just a case of working out how to, you know, how, where, where to find those on the guitar. I think it's an interesting point that you raised there because, um, you know, as a teacher, when somebody comes along, they already play another instrument. Even if they're yeah. still starting off on the guitar, you c it's easy to, to just say, well, you know, they play violin or they play piano or whatever. There's this cross-referencing of things that they know on that instrument, but also the fact that they understand already that they have to practice. You know, yeah. they, you know that that's that even doesn't even have to be said. That they're not yeah. going to go anywhere unless they practice. So that's that's a great thing because obviously when you're starting off with people, it's like what you mean I have to I have to practice something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. No. Right, that I mean, obviously I, makes it, that that the mindset's already there when you you've been playing an instrument. You're obviously pretty good on saxophone if you were gigging places. Uh, I was I was I was all right. I mean, hmm. I, I was pretty good, and and I was hanging out with guys a lot older. So I was in the band with guys that were sort of in their late twenties, early thirties. Hmm. First band I joined, and and it was great. They were just lovely guys. They were really encouraging, hmm. and. Um, and, and they, they were better than me as well. So that really helps, you know, when, when you're playing with people that are better than you, you know, uh, it, it really helps bring, bring your playing level up, you know. So, um, so yeah, I was okay. I mean, I, I mean, I've done a few, you know, the sax has come in handy over the years. I've done a few dub, sort of doubling gigs um, and, and, and a few other gigs on sax. So, um, it's kind of come in handy, but I got to, I got to about nineteen or twenty, and and I I just realised that I, I was just not that there was there was so many absolutely incredible sax players out there in the world, and I, I, and I just sort of I knew I was never going to get there. You know, it wasn't really my instrument, um, whereas guitar I felt it was, and I had a chance to to yeah. do well, on it, so, and I. And I, I was just more into the guitar, so I sort of let the sax go, you know, in my, in my early 20s. Yeah. Now, there's an interesting thing here from the, you know, like the psychological aspect, obviously, where it seems that contemporary guitar, you know, rock guitar or whatever, seems yeah. to offer a possibility where, like you've said about the saxophone, you can sort of go, well, actually, for me to be that good, I've got to do that. And yeah. that's not going to happen because there's all these other guys are doing this stuff. 
And a little bit like that, I had this same thing with classical guitar. Right. I, I was playing classical guitar and, and, and electric guitar. And I got to a point thinking, it's got to be one or the other, actually. Because to be a great classical guitar player, you've got to spend, you know, yeah, shed, you know, yeah. shed of hours just doing that. And of course, you've got your fingernails to worry about, you know. Yeah. But of course, the electric guitar, I can I can use the, the ideas from the classical guitar on the electric guitar, no problem. But I can't do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I, you know, you have to make that decision. And I would have thought there's a similar thing going on there with the saxophone. Because the ability to play lines on a saxophone and the way that the saxophonist thinks is actually yeah. different from a guitarist. Um, yeah. But Very. when you get to a certain level on guitar, you have to start thinking like, you know, if you wanted to play any jazz stuff, you've got to think like a sax player to get your head around the moves, you know. Yeah. You can't just put your way around a pentatonic scale type of thing. Yeah, and that was going to say you, you, you saying that has made, made me think that um, um, it's, it's one of the things that I've said to students over the years when I've been teaching um, improvisation, mm. it, um, that when, when I played the saxophone, the, the, the way I thought about, you know, playing was completely different to the guitar mm. um, because, you know, we, we tend to learn the guitar with sort of shapes and patterns is quite visual. Um, whereas if, if you if you play sort of jazz or blues sax, it's more about your ear and intervals and you know jumping around and playing the tunes and melodies yeah. and kind of a bit more of a musical approach, you know. So I've, yeah. I've I've tried to teach that over the years, you know. I've tried to get people away from that scalar sort of yeah. approach improvising and uh, and I think playing the sax helped me to understand that, you know, yeah. myself. Yeah, and interestingly, you know, with the NLP, obviously, yeah, I, th I think a, a lot of people understand what NLP is because I always rabbit in and on about it at some point. But right. course, th those, there is that sort of thing about you know what what is it that you're using? What is that sensory thing? And guitar, yeah. as you say, there there is the visual aspect of patterns, or the, or maybe there's a tactile thing about the pattern or yeah. the board on guitar. Whereas with the saxophone, there's nothing to see. It's all about what you're hearing. Yeah. So, you know, you're having to hear, you know, you know, you're forming up the scale and all the rest of it, but you can't look at a fretboard. That's what I'm sort of saying. So it is yeah. a very different approach, isn't it? It, it is. But I, I think, um, I think internally, you know, it's, in, it's interesting to talk to other musicians about what, what goes on inside their heads. Um, and with with us, um, I don't think I've ever spoken to saxophonists about this, but I've spoken to singers yeah. and asked them what you know what 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 are they picturing in their heads when they're singing? Or what are they wearing? A few a few of them have said that they visualise. Um, they, they visualise when they're singing, they visualise, you know, shapes or points or even um, my sister's um, a singer, she sings, we, we work to, together quite a lot. And she, she sort of visualises sort of dots on a chart or some sort of graph that go up and down according to where the, the pitch is that she's trying to sing. So it, she's, she's having quite a visual internal experience when she's singing. Mm. That's that's very interesting because I, I I do a little bit of teaching of singing, and I'm always intrigued by watching other singers working and what they do, and it's sort of you know like as you do it, if you're involved in things like NLP, you're you're sort of aware of people's body language in a particular way, and I've yeah. always been intrigued by somebody like Adele, for instance, who seems to draw the line that she's singing. If you watch her do things she'll do this with her hand as she does some sort of thing yeah. and I, as you say I think that's that is an, an important point there's an in, sort of an internal visualization going on for a lot of yeah. stuff we don't you know you, they probably don't yeah. they don't probably even know because you know what it's like when, when you ask somebody something how do they do something they often go don't know <laughs> that's the oh, yeah. first response isn't it 
um, until you sort of push that a little bit further. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. So um, we're already sort of wandering onto territory of NLP. Let's, let's sort of move back a little bit with this because I'm yeah. interested in this early early thing about you know when you started playing guitar and you started gigging so what what sort of band obviously some sort of heavy rock band ish is it like sort of yeah Mark meets ACDC UFO meets ACDC I don't know School yeah band. the first well the first band I think I, the, that I gigged in was was when I, when I was playing sax and that was that was called the Desert Island Dicks D-I-F. <laughs> bit, bit risque, you know, at yeah. the time. Well, it was then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was just a fun kind of funk funk band, really. We, we wrote our own stuff, and that was, that was really good fun. Yeah. Um, and when I started playing guitar, um, I formed a band with a couple of my mates, and it was called Stonker. Oh. Good, good, <laughs> like, good, honest, teenagers, heavy metal band. Name that one. Um, so that 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 was the first band, and we um, we we wrote our own stuff, and you know, got out gigging, playing pubs, and stuff like that. Um, so so that that was pretty good fun. Um, I'm just trying to go through the sort of chronology, really. I think that that band broke up when people sort of went off to uni and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I I was I was playing. Uh, around about that time, I was playing um, with a friend of mine, Pete Barnacles, a drummer, and um, uh, absolutely awesome player, you know. And another another guy, Steve Dunning, is a bass player, who was at my school, and and he he's an absolute genius, you know. And he, he was a still is, and he, he was like even at school, he was he was the kid at school that was just awesome on bass and guitar and you know godlike to yeah. everyone else and um and we we ended up sort of playing together we and we called we had, we had a sort of power trio which we called the trio and it was all it was all instrumental rock stuff you know kind of satriani whittly bluesy yeah. um that, that we wrote you know so that that was great fun, and that 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 really sort of advanced me as a player because they those two were like, you know, sort of much more developed musicians than I was, um, and um, so playing with it, those guys was fantastic. We 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 ended up living together as well. We ended up rent, renting a house together, so we did the whole thing of you know, of doing that and, and playing together like all the time, um, and I, you know, and I was with you know another few bands around in my early 20s and, and and we just used to play a lot you know used to rehearse you know two or three times a week and then um gig and stuff so you know you you, you just it, it it's so good playing with other musicians I often say to students you know you can you can gain more from playing one gig than six months of lessons and working stuff out you know it's such a huge learning curve so, um, so yeah, that that was that was kind of what what went on um, in my early twenties. I, I got um, I got a teaching job when I was about twenty two up in Coventry, and we were we were a teaching band. We were employed by the local authority to go around teaching pop music in schools. Oh, cool! It was quite a novel. It, it was quite it was quite an innovative thing at the time. Yeah. And, but it was, it was a great job because it was three days a week. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, um, and it was an actual salary job, you know, so for a young musician, it was, it was fantastic. Mm. So I had a sort of reliable income from that. And we go around, go around schools, teaching the kids um, in bands, you know, songwriting and, playing skills and putting concerts and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I got into a bit of um, some peripatetic teaching in the schools as well at, at, at that time, which, which I carried on doing for, for quite a few years um, in London after, after, afterwards. So, so that, that was a 
that, that was a really good experience. And I, again, I was quite young, um, hadn't had much teaching experience, but got thrown in at the deep end. Um, I remember when I went for this sort of interview audition for the job, the, um, the guy said, right, just go into that room and teach, teach those kids a song, teach them how to write, write a song with those kids and get them playing something, you know. And I've never done anything like that before. You know, I taught, I taught a bit of guitar, but I've never taught yeah. um, a group of five kids, teenagers, and um, hadn't taught songwriting or anything like that. So it was one of those experiences where I went in completely on the fly and um, just let, all you can do is let whatever comes out come out and you can't there's no time to plan anything no um and uh you know and I, and I think I I just sort of got them to play E minor to A or something and got a little groove going with the bass player and the drummer and worked out a simple guitar part for the guitarist and a little tune for the keyboard player and you know hey presto yeah playing a song yeah because I think that sort of thing is a revelation to to people who've never done that sort of thing of just, you know, like we would have done, hang out with your mates and just bash something out and then something starts to sound reasonably okay. And then gradually over time, it, it sort of forms, you know. Yeah. Um, when, you know, it's just really a couple of chords that go with one another. Uh, and that whole idea of playing together, yeah, is the thing, isn't it? You know, um, and you, I, you know, I was going to say about this this thing that you were doing, going around with a, a band teaching, you know, being a, yeah. being a band that's teaching, being in a band type of thing, or teaching popular music yeah. around the schools. Yeah. Those type of things have dried up now. Um, but th there were a lot of initiatives like that that were incredible, run by various councils and stuff. Mostly, actually, I think in the Midlands and the North, because you didn't see an yeah. awful lot of that down here. But um, and you think, well, what better way of getting kids involved in music? And it doesn't have to be contemporary music; it could be anything. You know, it could be a brass band coming and and do something. You know, I've seen all that. And you think, well, that's that's the way to fire kids' imagination with music, and always has been. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And and the great thing about you know learning pop music is is that is that you can, with with, with very little actual knowledge of, of your instrument, you, you can be given a simple part, you know, that works. Exactly. And you use it with other people, and and it's. I think it's a real thrill, you know, for for, for them when they when they do that and it first comes together and they they're like, well, this is actually sounding like something, you know. I know, I know, I know. I mean, really, it's from my point of view, that's always been the interest about you know what is music really, you know. If you take if you strip all the the stuff away, all the detail, like you know, the scales and all the stuff that we we get now. If you go back in time, you know, what yeah. what is it? You know, and you think, well, there's that that is this sort of really unusual, you know, magical aspect about music that makes you feel in a particular way or whatever. And you think that that's the thing you really want to well, I think, you know, you need to engender and get people to experience what it's like to do something. And like you say, couple of chords or a little melody part or something something on the yeah. bass that somebody can play and it's almost like you, you are tapping into a live feed with that you know where it's like well i don't really know what i'm doing but this just yeah is, you know, it's happening and i think that's a very important thing you know yeah yeah but one that was great about that project was that um it's um we, we we were working in in um, some of the inner city areas of Coventry that, that were quite, um, you know, uh, th th there was a lot of poverty there and um, th they were dangerous areas as well. I mean, a couple of them were like no-go areas, you know, for the police and stuff. At, th at that time, it was, it was um, 
it was quite dodgy uh, in some of, and, and a lot of the, the kids um, came from those sort of backgrounds, you know. And um, it, it's a leveler, isn't it? Because, you know, it, they, they can do something and get their teeth into it and, and it gives them a, um, an identity. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I'm in a band. No, I'm, a, I'm in a band. And that, that can really give them some confidence then in themselves. Yeah. I've noticed this a lot with teach, teaching guitar to youngsters as well. And the parents have said this a lot. And they've said that, oh, oh they've got so much more confident from, because they're learning the guitar. Yeah. You know, because they've, they've got something for themselves then. And that this is, they, this is who I am. This is how they kind of mark themselves out. Yeah. And make, make them a little bit different and special in a good way, you know. Yeah, because, you know, you, your comment about guitar um, earlier on about, yeah, you know, there's this sort of link between the guitar, you know, interested in rock music and girls, you know. Uh, right. it actually, is a really valid point because, you know, my my sort of thing into, into, into music was seeing people... I remember there was a lad who turned up at my school, which was in Dartford. And he was um, part Indian, I think, or Salonese or something, I don't know. But he was he looked like Jimi Hendrix, right? So he was oh, already... He was also good. Confident, right? And yeah. his name was Shane. And he was only there for a little while, but he could play, he could play a bit of guitar. And literally, he would sit and play and... The whole class would sit around and watch him play, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and all he was doing was playing a few chords. That was it. He wasn't doing anything clever. He was playing the chords for, you know, these are the chords for soul sacrifice, you know. It didn't, yeah. No melody, nothing. No lead, nothing. But it was mesmerising. And yeah. I just thought, that is so cool. I want to be like that. I want to do that. And it was that type of thing of, again, it's an identity thing. Like you say... As the kids get started, that's something that they do that sets them apart from the other kids that are doing whatever yeah. it is nowadays, you know, with their Xboxes or whatever. They're getting something yeah. and they're doing something that creates something else in their personality, which is exactly the same, really, for what, you know, your comment and my, you know, my story about what got me interested in playing the guitar. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, well, what we would call character building. <laughs> I don't know. But well, well, I think it, it is in, in a way because, um, you know, in, in, all, in order to be able to learn the guitar, you need to implement certain, um, certain abilities or, or kind of personal strengths or resources, you know, for example being committed to it and, and being motivated and organizing yourself and mm. having, some, you know, um, sticking with something. So in those ways, that sort of basic kind of um, skills in life that, that you kind of have to apply if you're going to be successful at anything, really. So in that way, I think they are. It is character building. Yes. Yes, it is character building. Absolutely. So... Yeah. When did you start? Because you were saying that you were getting, you were interested in um, how people learnt. When did that really start to kick in? That you were going, now there's something going on here that some people seem to do. Is it that type of thought that you had? Yeah, it was. Um, I'd, I'd been teaching for a few years, and I'd noticed, you know, some students come in. And, um, you know, you show them something and they get it straight away. Mm. And another one will come in, try and show them the same thing and they, they don't get it at all. And um, I, I was just getting really curious about what, you know, why, why, why is that? Mm. Is it to do with them? Is it to do with me as a teacher or, or what yeah. is it? Yeah. And then, then I, um, when, when I read that, that book uh, by Joseph O'Connor, not pulling strings. He, he was talking about different uh, learning styles, about some people are more visual learners, some people are more auditory, some are more kinesthetic. 
and that that really sort of um, that really kind of resonated. That really clicked with me because I thought, oh yeah, that, that that makes sense. I could think about people that I was teaching and that that theory applied to, you mm. know. Um, and and then when I learned about all the um, you know rapport stuff, what rapport is and how to how how to build rapport with with people which is one of the first things you, you learn when you're doing an NLP course. And, it, and it's mind-blowing. I mean, for me, it was, it was mind-blowing when I first learned that basic stuff. Mm. And then, of course, I realised a lot of this stuff I was doing already, but I didn't... I either didn't know I was doing it or I didn't know what to call it, you know. Um, but, you know, um, so so just... And I started using some of these ideas straight away in my lessons. For example, you know, how to how to build rapport with someone so that they feel really comfortable, you know, when they're sitting in front of you. Because let's let's face it, a lot of people when they first come for lessons, they feel quite anxious. Or they can feel quite quite anxious and it's it's quite scary. And and I know myself when I've gone to learn something new and I've been on the other sort of the shoes being on the other foot. I know, I know what that can be like, you know, I mean, I went for singing lessons a few years ago and I suddenly found myself feeling really nervous and like, yeah, up here, you know? Um, so to be able to put, help someone to feel comfortable, feel at ease, feel relaxed, um, very quickly is obviously a key. You know, it's a key skill for a, for a guitar teacher or any any kind of teacher, um, because then you're you're helping them to get into a very good state to learn. You know, um, so all, all that stuff was really when I learned about all that stuff, that really makes sense. You know, because our our ability to learn something is very dependent on our our state, our state of mind and our state state of being at, at that time. I mean, try learning something new when you're having a panic attack, you know. Yeah. Your, your brain won't allow you to learn anything new because you're in a fight or flight mode. Yes, exactly. Um, so any level of anxiety really is, um, is, is going to inhibit the ability to take, take on board new information. So that, that's what's great about learning the NLP stuff is, is you know, um, some, some, one of the things was, was being able to build rapport with someone quickly, a student, and then helping them to be in a good state for learning, you know. But of course, it, it obviously has an application to, like, stage presentation and how you can, you know, model somebody who's a good performer yeah, uh, I mean the applications are astonishing, really, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, the, the the thing the thing with being being on stage is that um, you know, the, the, I think all musicians can that have performed can relate to this: is that you can go out on stage one night and it's awesome, everything sort of clicks into place, you you're in the zone, you know. And you play great, and then you can go go out again the next the next night, and um, you know it, it, it's nowhere near as as good, or your performance isn't as good, or you feel nervous, or and it's like, well, what's the difference, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and with with the NLP stuff, you can you can work out you can work out what's well, what's the difference, you know? What made that first night? go so well compared to because it gives you those kind of tools where you can analyze yourself in that way exactly. and, and the sort of nuts and bolts of your your inner workings you know i used to um uh, i had a girlfriend who had um a place up in near greenwich and um she she had a a, a, a house you know, somebody used to house share with uh, who worked for Greenwich um, Theatre as the yeah. as the um, wardrobe mistress 
and um, she would talk about different actors and actresses and what their you know sort of quirks were, you know what yeah. other things they they um, things that they would wear or do before they went on the stage. Yeah. And of course, when you listen to that, you think, you know, when you have your sort of rational mind on there, you think, oh, it's nonsense. But of course, in actual fact, it's not, because it's a sort of a, a preparation ritual for getting yeah. you home, for going on to do whatever it is, whether that's having a, a particular pair of socks that you like to, to wear, which was the case yeah. of one famous actor, um, or, you know, the fact that somebody would have to spin round three times or whatever, you know, but it was that type of thing. Yeah. Because once yeah. you start to to look at that, you go, well, actually, it's about states of mind. You know, it's about how do you get to that zone as yeah. the improviser or that zone of being, you know, getting in the groove, all these things that we talk about music. Yeah. And there's most definitely, as you say, certain skills, tools that you can use to, yeah. to help. Well, I think with, with all, a lot of that stuff that you were just talking about, uh, those sort of rituals, it's, um, it's very Pavlovian. Yeah. Yes. It's something that, that you've done, you know, it's like a warm up or sports people do it, you know, before they take that big shot or that goal. Yeah. Or, I mean, I, one, one of the bands I, I work in, um, Bjorn again said, yeah. Abitur. And um, every, um, the start of every show, we, we run some intro music, and um, which is, um, which, which is a, so it's a song called Arrival, which is an ABBA song, but it's an instrumental version that Mike Caulfield did. So every time, just before we were announced, you know, hello, good evening, this is Bjorn again. And then da -da 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 this intro music comes on, and that's just like an instant for yeah. me, yeah. because I've done hundreds of shows and I've got a lot of positive feelings about playing that that stuff, and doing those shows. That's like a trigger, you know. That that is like a an auditory trigger yeah. that gets me into into my zone with that you know, what I'm about to do, and it kind of gets my whole nervous system, you know, tuned up for going out to do that particular performance. Yeah, that's fair. But anything really is really powerful, and, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's really how the, the NLP stuff works, as you know, with this um, technique of an an anchoring, yeah. where you're actually consciously using some sort of trigger to you know help you get into a certain a positive state of mind and body for whatever it is you know you're gonna you're gonna be doing at that point in time and it's fantastic for musicians it's fantastic for, for performers and, yes. and, and you know, stage fright and all that sort of stuff um, it, it, it's great you know for helping with, with all of that stuff yeah yeah that was something I wanted to get onto because again this sort of encapsulates all of the aspects of uh, what you're doing in that respect the, the, obviously the psychological thing um, of you actually becoming you know collectively ABBA yeah personally Bjorn I guess is it Bjorn yeah so what's it like being Bjorn <laughs> It's, it's really good fun, you know, because uh, it's a character, you know, so I, I, I go into character when I, when I perform and we do a lot of interviews, any, any sort of TV or radio interviews we, we do in character. Wow. And improvise in character as well. So, um, and, and each one of us has got our own kind of, you know, our, our, our own unique sort of character. It's all very tongue in cheek. It's yeah. it's just a good laugh, you know. Yeah. But it's kind of a bit like a Swedish spinal tap. <laughs> that sounds brilliant. That sounds brilliant. So there's a big jump, obviously, between yeah. playing <laughs> um, heavy metal or you know Joe Satriani esque 
instrumentals. And yeah. being in, the, in, a, in an ABBA tribute band, well, I would say the ABBA, ABBA tribute band, really, um, how, did, how did that come about? Um, it was a lot of wine or alcohol. No, I've, I'd, um, I've been, you know, through my 20s, I've been uh, playing, you know, working, playing in bands, um, had an original band with, with my brother and we're trying to get a record deal and yeah. we got a publishing deal and then it kind of petered out. And um, I basically got to the end of my 20s and I was, I was absolutely broke, you know. I wasn't really making very much money for music. I put a lot of time into original projects, which didn't pay. And then, um, and then I saw a, I saw an advert for an audition um, for Bjorn again, and I'd never heard of them. Um, and at the same time, I, I, an agent, um, I was on the books of an, of an agent, like a session agent, and um, he he put me forward for it as well, actually. Um, and uh, anyway, I went, I went along for the, for an audition and, um, the, the guy said, oh yeah, you know, you, you look, you, you look quite a lot like Bjorn, you know, you could, could be, you could be good for this. And, um, and, and I did an audition and, and it's, uh, and, and it, we, with Bjorn again, we, we, we actually play, you know, we, we actually, <laughs> everyone's really good. I mean, it's a really high. Of of musician and and, and singers, um, it's not, it's not like some you know some tribute bands that where they don't actually play or sing at all. I mean, it's, we we all play live, we all sing live. There's like you know five harmonies going on on stage. Um, I don't know why I'm saying that actually. Just no, just no, it's important. Thing. No, it's very important. <laughs> very important. But, it's not easy to do, is it? It's quite, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, so I, I, I went along for the audition, and um, they um, and I got down to the last two people, two guys for the job, um, uh, and then I didn't get it. The other the other guy got it, so I thought, oh well, that's that's that. Um, and then a few months later, I got a phone call saying, oh, you know, it, it hasn't really worked out with this this guy. Um, are you available tomorrow to do a TV show? Oh, blimey. <laughs> and uh, and I, I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, look, just come in, come in for a meeting in the morning. We'll talk about it. And uh, now I think I think it was, they called me on a Tuesday and the, there was, the show was on a Thursday. So they got me into the office on a Wednesday for, for another sort of interview. And, um, and, and I went along and it, you know, it all went well. Um, and uh, they, they, they offered me the job. And, and the next day I was doing a TV show. Um, so it was, re- it was really, and, and then within a month of joining, we did um, a live album and video at the Royal Albert Hall. Oh, blimey. So it was a real quick sort of, yeah. you know, bit of a baptism of fire. Yeah, that must have been an incredible amount of work. I'm just... Yeah, I had I had a week to learn um, the whole show, and then then we were off on tour. We went off on tour to Europe for a European tour for about um, three, two and a half, three weeks, and then got back from Europe and went and did the Royal Albert Hall thing. Nice. So I had about a week to learn all, the whole show, um, and it, and it's quite um, it's quite a challenge because. Um, if you listen to the ABBA recordings, there's there's a lot of guitars on there. You know, there's several guitar parts usually on most of the songs. Um, and um, but I'm, I, I basically cover all like all the main guitar parts. So I, the brief I got from the, the management was like, you know, we we don't try and copy it exactly. Um, it's kind of like a live rock and roll version of ABBA. So heavy it up, you know, rock it up, beef it up. And, um, you know, so, so I sort of came up with parts that encapsulated the main guitar parts yeah. that were a lot rockier um, and that I could also do all the singing with as well because there was 
tons of backing vocals. It's all loads of harmony singing. And, and I've never really done that. I've never really done... Oh, oh my God. You know, because to me, that's like, you know, we're putting your musician's head on. It's like, that's a lot of work. You know? It's a lot of work, yeah. Um, and, then, and then to practice all the parts, you know, sometimes you're playing a, a lead line while you're singing a backing vocal, a completely different rhythm, you know, those sort of things. <laughs> uh, they're, not, they're not hard. If you listen to the guitar parts, you, you, you sort of go, oh, it's not, it's not a really hard gig. But um, we put the two together. With all the singing and, and also we're, you know, um, but the, the front four, we're really sort of performers, you know, we're, we're, we're fronting the whole show. We're in character on stage. So you've got to do all this seamless playing and singing whilst being in character, projecting out, doing all the chat as well, all the dialogue on stage. Yeah. Um, so so it, was, it was a huge amount to, to take on initially. Um, and, and, we, and we had, um, I had one, one rehearsal before we went up on tour, one, one actual rehearsal with, with the guys with the band. So again, it's one of these sort of in at the deep end deals, you know. But it's great, you know, you learn really quickly. You, yeah, I mean, again, it's one of those sort of stories that I, I hear again and again. I, I've, I've just, I've literally just done a, an interview with Steve, Steve White, the drummer, and he was talking about, oh, you know, yeah, um, sort of early on when he, he, he goes to, do something for the for the MU, um, and he's only like I don't know, fourteen or fifteen, and and this guy says to him, "Oh, do you want to, what are you doing on Saturday night?" Type of thing. And he says, "Why?" He says, "Well, do you want a gig?" So he ends up then suddenly doing what was what, what was it? Wait, what did you say? Sid Cup, Sid Cup, Conservative Club. Yeah. And it's, can you do a waltz? Can you do in this type of thing? And he didn't know any of the songs, and it's just like in at the deep end and it's the best way yeah. to learn that and and again i think we that experience you have had that a lot early on wouldn't you playing gigs where it's yeah. like i don't know this song some guy says do you know this song by such and such and it's like i don't know can you hum it to me get the cause and he just bluff your way through it type of thing it's that attitude of being able to play and and, and just get the job done I think yes. that's, that's that's such a skill. Um, yeah, definitely. and and I you know, without the ex without the experience of doing lots of little gigs and stuff like that, I don't, I don't know how how easy it is for musicians now to have that. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I mean, when I look back to my twenties and I was playing uh, covers band gigs, and and it was like that a lot. Is that you turn you wouldn't know what you were playing until. Or, or, or you wouldn't even know until the singer called out the song. Yeah. You're so in actual fact, you, you're already sort of prepped up on that that way of being able to play. Yeah. Um, you know, that sort of thing of like, okay, yeah. Or on all the tricks that you get, well, it's, you know, it's probably, you know, we're in the key of G, it's going to be this best of luck type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Just the bass player knows it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 What's the nice player? Yeah, yeah. All the tricks. Um, so yeah, it probably set you up, set you up well for that, didn't it? So this obviously transforms everything, doesn't it? Because you're 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 really that's a completely different ball game we're, we're on now. I would say. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I went from um, you know j just about kind of scraping a living to um, earning loads of money, you know, or, or what was loads of money at that time and, and playing really high profile shows. And at the time when I joined the band, it was, it was really successful. I mean, um, you know, we, we would do sell out tours in theatres and arenas, so selling more tickets than a lot of the pop artists, you know, um, Play, you know, we, we were playing at stadiums. We played at Wembley Stadium, you know, supporting yeah. the girls back then, yeah. which was a, one of my teenage dreams to play at Wembley Stadium. Yeah. Um, and um, that, that, that was the, the sort of level and, and all the 
all, all the treatment you got alongside that, you know, nice, nice, nice transportation and great hotels. And remember the first tour we went on, that I went on around the UK, the band was sponsored by Saab. Um, being a, yeah. you know, ever being Swedish, yeah. and um, and I, I remember going to the management office to sort of negotiate the the tour fee, um, which they left until the day of the first day of the tour, very strategically, um, and then um, and then going off to do the tour, and then you know being handed a sub keys for a brand new Saab and say, well, we're, we're sponsored by Saab, there you go, you've got a brand new Saab to, to drive around to do this tour with, you know, nice. stuff like that. So um, it, it was it was great. It was a really good good experience. We played a lot of really good festivals, which is a lot of fun. Um, but I mean, the, the whole thing's quite bizarre that, you know, a tribute band or tribute show would be doing these kind of gigs. I mean, I, I couldn't get my head around it at first at all. No, but of course, because there, were, you know, you were ABBA, effectively, weren't you, for all intents and purposes? Because you know, Saab would have, if it, if ABBA ex existed at the time, Saab would have been supporting ABBA to go on tour. But because they weren't there anymore, yeah, you know, I, I think telling that forward, weren't you? That's one of the the, uh, the things about you know for a tribute band to be successful, obviously the original band it, it's better if they're not playing anymore because no one can go and see them, so they want to come and see you. Exactly. So uh, and it, it was early days for tributes as well. Yeah, you know, it was because in that time I can remember um, there was there were you guys and then there was the bootleg Beatles and yeah. and you know. That you were the two, from what I can remember, the two big, the big names, right, in the, in the tribute thing. I mean, since then, I know, you know, there's a lot of Queen things and Pink Floyd and stuff like that that have really sort of developed. But I, I can't really, I think there was a there was a Stones one that was quite big. But yeah, it was really between the two of you, I think, from what I can remember. Um, now there's lots of stuff, isn't it? It's just, you know. Yeah, it's a tribute yeah, yeah. about everything, but um, yeah, That's right. But that really captured the imagination, I think. Those two two bands. Um, yeah, I think with with the with the Abba thing because it's um, um, it's it's a really good show. You know, it, there's, there's 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 dancing, there's costumes, there's there's good. You know, I mean, we're basically playing the songs of some of the best pop songwriters. Exactly, 20th century, you know. So you can't yeah. wrong, yeah. Uh, and it's it's family entertainment. So it, it just gets booked everywhere, you know. Yeah. So it's really popular. Yeah. Uh, so no, it's 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 nice. It's it's just a feel good gig. It's a nice feel good gig to do yeah. because the audience love it and they they go nuts. Yeah. You know? And there's there's not many there's not many bands that you you could say that about that you can play gigs and you go out there and they go absolutely bonkers for you, you know? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant, um, brilliant show type, you know, the, the whole idea itself, whoever came up with that, the, that idea it's because it's, as you say, it's not just the songs, is it? Oh no, the songs are good, are good enough, but it's the whole, as you say, the, the costumes and, you know, uh, you know, the there, there's, um, there's a lot of banter on stage. There's a lot of there's there's a lot of comedy yeah. between the characters, um, and and it's all you know. Most of it is that there is a structure to what we say, but a lot of it is ad libbed. Mm. So you never really know mm. how it's going to go, you know. And and you're kind of feeding off the audience a lot, and the other guys and. So it keeps it interesting, you know, it keeps it that, that aspect of it. And, um, and it, it's quite a thing to sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going out as myself, you know, I'm not going out as Toby Ball, I'm going out as this character Bjorn. 
So in, in a way, it's easy to, to be more, um, for, for me, it's easy to be more extrovert on, on stage, I think, to, to fit the character. Yeah. Than would be if it was me, me being me, you know. Yeah. So what, because um, you're saying you're, you're still doing sort of teaching work and NLP stuff as well, because um, that that's an, an important um, aspect, I think, of what you've you've done. You've obviously found, I would have said, the NLP stuff useful for the character of Bjorn. Um, was there a lot yeah. of watching of Bjorn yeah. on stage? There was, yeah, there's quite a lot of modelling. Yes. <laughs> modelling of Bjorn early on. Um, so I had to sort of... Um, try and copy some of his mannerisms, if you like, on stage and the way he stood and moved and yeah. how he held his car and stuff. Um, not, not, not to like a, a really microscopic degree, but just so that there was, you know, there, there was that element. Um, and, and the way he spoke and stuff as well, or he speaks. So, yeah, I had to do that. That was all part of what I had to do when I was learning all the material at the start was watch, watch a lot of videos and see see how he moved around and stuff on stage. That's good. That's good. So what, um, what are you up to? Well, obviously, I was going to say what are you up to now, but you know what I mean. What's your, what are your sort of plans and what are you doing? Because... Um, well, I mean, obviously, the gigs are on hold for the time being. Um, so... Um, as soon as the gigs come come back on, then um, there's there's a load of dates in for this year for for Buell again. Um, if we can do them, um, there's I, I run a couple of bands as well myself, which we've, we've got quite a lot of work in a lot of work that we had in last year yeah. that got postponed and moved over to this year. So um, you know. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we can, we can yes. get the live work back. Um, one, one of those, I, I run a couple of bands. I've, it's another thing that I, I didn't mention is that I've, I've run my own bands over the years as well. Um, for, for over 20 years, my own function bands. And, um, that, that's been a really important part of my, my work and my business, um, running those bands. And, and that, that's been great as well. So, and one of, one of them is, one of the bands is called the Air Guitar Band and it's a classic rock genre. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's loads of fun, you know, okay. obviously for guitar. <laughs> the only reason I started it was so that, you know, it's purely self-indulgent, mm -hmm. um, but um, people absolutely love it, you know. So, so we, we do all the sort of 70s, a lot of 70s and 80s classic rock stuff. So I, I love doing like that. Blast. It sounds like a blast to do. It's really, it's really good. And so at the moment, I'm just, I'm learning a load of new stuff. I'm trying to push myself. I was learn, learning some Michael Schenker this week and um, a bit of Van Halen and getting some new songs ready for the set. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to take me a few months to get them worked up to the point where I can go out and gig them, you know. Yeah. So, um, so it's it's just sort of making some preparation, really, hoping that hoping that the the gigging world comes back online, you know. Um, but I'm doing the, like like everyone else, I'm doing stuff on Zoom, I'm doing guitar lessons on Zoom, um, doing NLP sessions on on Zoom as well. So just just really kind of ticking over. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But in a way it's been quite good because I've, I've played a lot more guitar than I have done for years in terms of my own practice, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there are always that, you know, when you look at it, you can sort of go, well, this has been quite good because, I mean, for me, it's been, wow, it's, it's quite easy to get people to do interviews because they're not doing anything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, is quite, which is quite good, really. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as you say, you, projects and things that you sort of thought, oh, you know, I really should get around to doing that. Now it's like, okay, you know, 
got time to do it. So yeah, yeah. So th we'll see how long that uh, that goes on for, and then hopefully, with a bit of luck, we'll get back back to being able to play somewhere. We'll be yeah, well, I think it's like um, you know, for for years when I when I was really really busy, I was just absolutely hanging to be not busy. You know, yeah. like oh, I wish I had some time where I could just chill. And, you know, yeah. I've got to go and do gigs and tours, and you know. Uh, and now, now, now it's like careful what you wish for, isn't it? Really, so. oh, totally. Well, I, I said this actually to my wife about, you know, what is it? You know, is it possible that when you get enough people wishing for something, it starts things start to happen like that, where you got the thing like, you know, there are too many people on the planet type of thing. We we got the David, David Attenborough thing, and the, you know this thing about the ecology and you know and everything there's too much air, air travel and too much and then suddenly we get a situation where we've almost got what we've asked for you know something where people are panicking because yeah. people are dying of, of of something that they didn't we didn't even know of okay you know it existed but nobody really knew about it there's no air travel to speak of you know nobody's going anywhere you know we're not exactly damaging the environment by even getting in the car anymore so you sort of go yeah like you say it's it, you know it's a, you've got to be careful what you wish for because yeah yeah no absolutely and I, and I think like any situation in life it's you know it, it's what what meaning you give to it yes to really how you feel about it yeah you know yeah. to a certain degree yeah and obviously there's stuff that's out of our control but um but you know certainly reframing things like that you know, which again is another NLP aspect of things, looking at it and going, well, look, this does give us an opportunity to do more guitar yeah. playing or what, you know, more practice. Yeah. Or, you yeah. know, finish that book that wasn't done or whatever. Yeah, no, yeah. that's absolutely true. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, Hopefully we'll um, be a, a bit wiser when we come out the other side of this. But there's no guarantee. <laughs> I'm going to try to be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you sort of wonder whether everyone's just going to try and go snap back to exactly what well do. i don't what know if that's like. going to be quite possible because of literally of how things have happened but um, be interested yeah. to see what happens but uh yeah i think it'd be quite a long time wouldn't it you know economically there's a fallout to this as well yeah and uh, that's that's got a long i think that's got a long time to play through but we'll we'll see yeah. anyway so that's been that's been brilliant it's lovely to talk nlp with somebody as well I don't, yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, don't normally get that opportunity too much. Um, you know. And um, also, the, 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 all the stuff that we were talking about with, with sort of Bjorn again, and it was really good. Because that's, to me, that's a little bit like, that's that stuff in action from an artistic point of view. Because often, yeah. you know, when you do this, it's like, well, you can do this stuff and people's like, yeah, but so what do I do with the I can deal with stage fright, okay? When I mean, it's all a bit, but, but what you've done is, I thought, you know, you've become another character. Um, and, sorry, I lost my for about. Yeah, no, sorry, yeah. you're still there, just about. You're still just about there with me. All right, then. Yeah. So, good to see you then. Yeah, you too, mate. Yeah, yeah and um, yeah, well, hopefully, when we're out of house arrest, we'll be able to um, meet up somewhere. Have another coffee. Exactly. That was different. Good to chat to Toby. Um, I love the um, the story of the, of uh, Bjorn again. Um, I think there's a lot to be taken from from that about um, you know the psychological aspects of things. Um, if you're interested in NLP, you could always drop me or Toby a line about it. Um, obviously, contact details for Toby will be in the show notes. And usual thing, if you want to help me out, uh, there's a Patreon link on there, or you can subscribe to YouTube, or give me a, you know, a really good rating on iTunes is good as well. Okay, so until next time, see you then. Mm -hmm.